text it to me. It's good to see you here this morning. God bless you for being here. Um, it's been a beautiful day. Um, day the Lord has made. We had a great time in early service, and I thank you for being here. If you're a if you're new or a guest, uh, we welcome you. I'm glad you've chosen to be here today. The way that we begin our services, we we'll always go to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to kneel. I invite you if you want to come and kneel with me at the altar, you can. If you'd like to remain seated where you are, that's fine. But let's go to the Lord in prayer together and invite him to be here today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for the way you look down on us and you love us and you care for us. Lord, I thank you for every person in this building. I pray that today we will sense your spirit, that we will know your spirit, we'll know your heart, we'll hear your voice. Our hearts are heavy at this the thought of what happened 20 years ago yesterday, we lift those families to you. But Lord, we do know that you're in control. We know that you have a plan for us. And that plan is to live like you and to walk like you and to invite you into our lives and then to follow you. And that you invite us into a love relationship with you we know that you have our best interest at heart of course with me Gentle shepherd, come and lead us, for we need you to help us find our way. Stand with me. Gentle shepherd, come. strength from day to day there's no other there's no other we can turn to today sing it Gentle shepherd, come and lead us, for we need you to help us find our
Pay the price for all my guilty Who would care that much about me Let me tell you about my Jesus Oh Take all that away when we call on your holy name. Let us let go of our shame.
us a love that's deep. And we know that you walk with us every step of the way. With you. Thank you for the message of the, that we've already heard through music. I pray it impacts our hearts and lives and digs down deep to the very root of our soul. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the things we added just a couple weeks ago was a, that we read a scripture together, hopefully, that kind of em, embed into our memory. And so if you will, stand with me. And uh, Hunter, I think, is going to put it up on the screen. Whether you are in the faith, test yourselves. Go ahead. There you go. In you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. Back that up, if you will, Hunter. We're going to read it again because I, I do believe, I do believe that we can read better than that, okay? Read it with me. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail to meet the test.
If you will, take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew. Thank you, young folks, for leading us so well. And we talked about that we want to be authentic and not inauthentic, not counterfeit, not a, a, a knockoff, if you will, like you knock off shoes, you got those Reeboks that everybody likes to wear. Reeboks may not be the latest thing, but you get those, uh, um, those cheaper ones. We don't want that. We want to be authentic. And for, and for the first three weeks, we talked about the authentic church. Uh, a month ago, we said uh, authentic church talked about foundation being salvation. We talked about the authentic church, the uh, function and the service. And last week, we talked about the authentic church having focus. And if you lose your focus, uh, you lose it all because focus determines finish. Today, we're going to talk about the authentic Uh, the names have been changed to protect the guilty. It's a story that I've seen happen more times than I care to, um, to name, or enumerate, mention. His name is, well, his name could be anything. It could be Joe, it could be Todd, it could be Dan. Baptist Church and uh, the church was named New Heart they had been serving the church for about five years and everybody loved him he loved everybody he was well respected well liked he lived among the people he the people and when he stood in the pulpit he preached truth to the people and they loved that within that congregation there was one very prominent family now the name the last name of this family doesn't really matter again it could be it could be pounds it could be stringer it could be watts it could be luke it doesn't matter but it was a very prominent family i mean they were so prominent that they were counted on for everything. They were, they were prominent in their faithfulness. You had a service. They were there. You, you had an event. They were, you could count on them. They were there. They were prominent in giving service. If you had an opening in the church, you had something, a need that needed to be met, they were there. Johnny on the spot. They were prominent in, in their giving. and bring them to the Lord, but, but they would give to But within that family, there was one person. He was an older man. Oh, years earlier, he had attended the church with them. He had actually walked the aisle, prayed a prayer, gotten baptized, and was a church member. But then something happened. <laughs> something happened. Now, in the context of this story, it doesn't matter. Everybody knew what happened or nobody knew what happened. It doesn't matter because it happened years ago. And he has heard to say, I'm not going back to church ever again. Not only that church, no church. Years It happened long before he got there. And he wanted just to kind of, <coughs> excuse me, make a, make a friendship with this guy to see if he could help him because the family was such a good family. So <coughs> on several occasions,
But every time he would see Paul, it was, he was met with consternation. He was, he was met with a hard attitude. He was met with tough words. And it didn't matter what the preacher said. The man would go, Preacher, I know where that church is, and I know the people that go to that church. And the message was, if I ever need you again, I'll get back there. So the, this pastor, he, he decided after a time of visiting this man that he was probably doing more damage than he was good. And so what he decided to do is to just commit Paul to prayer. Some time passed. And one day the pastor got a call from a member of that family and it went something like this. Pastor, I'm sorry to inform you. But suddenly last night, Paul died. Assured the family member that he would do the service. Offered his condolences. Had a prayer over the... could he say about this man? What would he say about how, What scripture would he use and how would he tie it to the man's legacy? How would he tie, tie it to his life? What would he say? Well, a couple of days later, as is custom, the pastor sat down with the family to talk about the service. Music, other things to go on. During that meeting, one of the family members said this, Preacher, we know he was a rough customer. We know he didn't attend service like he did, should and didn't do other things like he should, but Preacher, he prayed the prayer. Now, the preacher knew exactly what message he was being given. They were giving him the subtle message that he, the pastor, needed to reassure them that Paul was in heaven. They wanted the pastor to assure him them that he was in heaven. Heaven. I wish I had a dime for every time I've heard a story like this. And I'm going to tell you the truth. It's, it's confirmed by a funeral director in another county who said to a group of ministers one day, in my 25 years of doing this work, talking about funeral directing, he said, I have never had a service for an individual who actually went to hell. He said, somehow, some way, by some means, in the message, there was always that he got into heaven. And I'm just going to pause there after that story and ask you this question. Does that bother you at all? Do you see anything wrong with that story? I mean, I understand. I get it. Every family member facing a death wants to know that their loved one is in heaven rather than that other place. Sadly, please listen. Sadly, we don't give it much thought until the time happens and then we want somebody else to make it right. Regularly, as over the past year, I've mentioned this scripture. Put it up there if you will, Hunter. It's Matthew 7, verse 21 to 23, and this is what it says. 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Drive out demons in your name and do many miracles in your name. Then I, Jesus, will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. Folks, I bring this to our attention because my personal demand, my, my personal call, my personal mandate, my personal heart is to as much as possible, as much as is in me, to remedy this situation where people expecting to go to heaven do not make it. <clears throat> and I've said that this scripture haunts me every time I stand in this pulpit. Christians. So here's what I'd like to do now. If you've got your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to back up to verse 13. You can roll that forward. We're going to back up to verse 13, and we're going to read this full message, this full message of Jesus from 13 to 20. Would you stand to honor the reading of God's holy word? <clears throat> I'll remind you, if you have a red print edition, you see it, that this is in red print because all these words are the actual words of Jesus. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and, and the road broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult is the road that leads to life and few find it. Be on your guard against false prophets who come in to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So, you'll recognize them by their fruit. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do mighty miracles, many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that we'll come clean with you and come clean with ourselves so that you can make us what you want us to. Need you and receive that heart change and life change. I pray that who has received you, <clears throat> lived for you, and now has kind of elbowed you out of their life. I pray that today will be the day that you will speak to us and draw us back to you. I pray that you will bind Satan from this building. I pray that the blood of Jesus will just cover this building and, and remove Satan's influence from our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. 
We're talking about the authentic Christian, and I will just tell you that. The concept of the authentic Christian, the outcome, the result of the authentic Christian starts right here. This is the result, is that, is that you walk through the, the narrow gate. You're walking through the, down the narrow way. You're walking and you find life. The result of being an authentic Christian is that you find life. And you say, Brother Jerry, what does this have to do with being an authentic Christian? Well, did you catch it in your scripture? One sentence he said twice. <clears throat> in verse 16, he says, you will recognize them by their fruits. Verse 20, he says, so you will recognize them by their fruits. I'm going to put that phrase up here on the screen. You will recognize them by their fruits. Whether they're inauthentic, whether they're counterfeit, whether they're authentic, whether they're real, or whether they It means you. You can't escape it. In fact, I'll tell, I won't tell you what I told the first hour. I almost, guys, preached a message entitled you. Because every time it comes to these big decisions, it's my, boy, preacher, if that had been here, you'd have got them. It's my wife. She's no good. It's my husband. He's no good. It's my children. They're no good. It's my way my mom and dad treated me. It's no good. Now listen, brothers and sisters, it's not my brother, it's not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. You see, it's you. Now if you look in the context of Scripture, who, is he who are we talking about? You. Well, he's preaching the Sermon on the Mount, and back in chapter 5, this is how it begins, and when he saw the crowd, or if you have the old King James, it says, seeing the multitude. Who was the crowd? Who were the multitude? Please listen. It was the believers and the non-believers. It was the What did I do? Man, I, I thought God was coming back. I thought that was a trouble. And people of difficult, different uh, ethnic backgrounds. It was people of different economic. Looking at you, and they said, "You, and you, you will recognize." And you go, "Brother Jerry, that's right." You know, I'll recognize. Well, you need to hear this. You're on both both sides of the equation, just like I am. Oh yes, you will recognize the authentic Christian. You will see the authentic Christian, but just no, make no mistake about it, the people see you too. They see you, they know you, they know your language, they know your action, they know your attitude, they know whether you measure up or not. You will both see people and you will be seen by people. The second part of this is you will recognize. Will re now recognize that has that air of familiarity. Told the first hour, went to a funeral on Friday of a of a, a distant relative, and I saw a cousin that I had not seen in fifty years, and we recognized each other. It was familiar. It's familiar. You see, the world knows what a Christian should look like. It's kind of like Acts 11. You can go home and read it. And Acts 11 is where they were first called Christians at Antioch. First called Christians. Why were they called Christians? Well, some people say that was God's name for them. But history tells us that maybe a little different story. Because it's like 
they begin to live and walk and talk and act and love and l- like Jesus. And so the community got tired of these folks being in their community. It was a little nickname that was derogatory. And they got it because of how they lived. You see, the truth is, it was the non-believers who recognized these people as being little Christ. Little Jesus Christ. Living like him and walking like him and talking like him and acting like him. Well, one of the great defenses... We guys in the modern church, we're pretty smart. We can find our excuses. And one of the things that we kind of push back on that is, Brother Jerry, man looks on the outside, but God looks on the heart. Man looks on the outside, but God looks on the heart. Well, you know, that's right. Did you read what he said here? And inwardly, they're like ravaging wolves. They try to put on a good exterior. They try to put on a good show for people. It's kind of like the the Pharisees of days of old. They try to put on a good show out here. Want everybody to think the best, but inside they're ravaging wolves. It is true that God looks on the heart. It is true that God knows what you're thinking right now. Hello? He knows what you're thinking. He knows whether you have dismissed this message just out of of, uh, uh, bounds. You've just dismissed this, that it doesn't. This doesn't matter to me. This this has nothing to do with me. What am I having for lunch? What ball game is on TV? Just dismissed it. God knows the heart. God knows what's going through your mind. Where am I going to eat lunch? The list goes on and on. God knows where you are. He does look on the heart. But you make no mistake. God, man looks on the outside. They look at you and they look at me. And they either recognize or they don't recognize Jesus in us. If somebody looks at you, can they see Jesus? You will recognize like at Antioch. Them are, it's not good English, but it's working. Them are the ones who have taken the word of God seriously. Them are the ones who have taken the life of Christ seriously. Them are the ones who have taken the way of salvation seriously. They're not the ones, are you listening? They're not the ones that walked the aisle, said a prayer, and took, got baptized to get their fire insurance. They're not the ones who have done all those things because of the family customs or, or just as a means to be culturally connected When you really know Jesus, you don't need all this other stuff to keep you in the church body because you have this well of of water growing in you, this spring of life growing in you that keeps you uh, connected and attracted to him. Them. Change. They look like Jesus. They live like Jesus. They walk like Jesus. They talk like Jesus. And everyone who comes around them know it. The way is narrow. The way of the world is broad. The way to life is difficult. The way to death is easy. That's what the scripture says. Being an authentic Christian. I'm not going to say it's hard once you have Jesus in your life. But I will tell you this, it's impossible without Jesus in your life. 
you will recognize them, he says. How? Here it is. By their fruit. You will recognize them by their, by what they produce in their life. Where they go. You see, the truth is, Jesus and a life changes a life. Jesus in a life changes what a person produces in his life. You know what he just said in this story? He talks our language. Hey, folks, we're on the creek, right? He's talking agricultural language. And he talks about trees and fruits and all this. He says, you know what? Good and, good and bad fruit are coming from good and bad tree. And the good tree can't produce bad fruit. And the bad tree can't produce good fruit. Whoo! That's that. That's us on the said in the middle of the week this week, he said, Our fruit is found from our union with God, he who abides in me. He went on to say, Are you listening? Our fruit is that directly traceable to our root. Huh. Do I need to say it again? He's talking our language, the language of agriculture. The root determines the fruit. I've always said this. You're around somebody and he hits this. What do you say when you hit your thumb with a hammer? I don't, please don't say it out loud. Ouch. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. Who's that? Chairman of the deacons trying to get attention there, okay? But here's what I'm going to tell you. You work with somebody, he hits it, and he lets this bad word go, and he goes, I don't know where that come from, and I'm going to tell you where it came from. It came from the root. You squeeze a lemon, you get lemonade. If you squeeze a lemon, don't expect to get orange juice. If you squeeze a Christian, you're going to get something different than if you squeeze a lost person. It's that simple. Truth is, too many of us, when you think about this law of sowing and reaping, this agricultural root to fruit, you think about how Jesus tied those together. I have said for more years than I know that too many of us Want to sow our wild oats. You reap what you sow. You see, folks. figure it out on your own you're not as smart as God and I'm just gonna I know you need to, I know you need to know this so I'm gonna tell you and you're not even as smart as the devil you see that's why John tells us greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world you've heard me say this before but listen make no mistake about it if you go it alone greater is he who is in the world than you are by yourself You see, you see, the truth is we have to examine ourselves, how we are in the faith. We need to test ourselves. We need to know ourselves. And I ask you, what kind of fruit is your life producing? Is there some spiritual fruit in your life or is everything worldly fruit? When people look at you, do they see a Christ-following person that some people call Christians where, where you're doing and acting and living and walking and talking and loving like Jesus. You know what it means to be an authentic Christian? It means to live in such a way that the preacher don't have to lie at your funeral. Living it because what you're doing right now is you're preaching your funeral with your life. And it all has to do with this thing of fruit. What are you producing? 
I have suggested that we're a Jesus church. Do people see you as a sensitive servant? I didn't say this first hour. It's just... I'll be talking about becoming next, some of our next times together. I'll be talking about how you become an authentic Christian. We'll talk about some more about being an authentic Christian. But in my research, I pulled up a man named Francis Chan. If you walk in my office today, there's a baby bottle sitting on my, on my desk. I'm trying to decide whether I'm brave enough to do it like he did it. He filled that baby bottle halfway full of milk. And he walked on the platform sucking on the baby bottle. He said, does this look wrong to anybody? And he read the scripture where it says, you know, I really wanted to feed you milk. But you can't, do, you can't, you're not good for anything except for the, I wanted to feed you meat. But you're not good at anything but the milk. And he said, and Francis went on to say, some of you are still sucking a spiritual baby bottle. When you should be eating spiritual meat today. Are you the sensitive servant? Have you grown enough to where it's not about me? It's not about my preferences. It's not about what I want. It's about what God wants to do here. It's about what he wants. It's about what he's laid forth. It's about, it's about his program. It's about his reaching people with love and care. Are you the sensitive servant? Are you unselfish? Are you spirit-filled? Are you encouraging? Are you joyful? You know, one of the things, I'm going to say this and so everybody can charge the platform and strangle my throat, but uh, Eric and I talked about it at lunch a time or two. One of the things that I've hoped to bring to our church is a sense of joy that we can have fun together. The joy of the Lord is my strength. What is your strength today? An authentic follower of Christ, an authentic Christian is filled with joy. You want to know why? It's because that they realize that apart from the grace and mercy of God, that they would be still on their way to hell. Man, death to life, darkness to light, hell to heaven. Is there any better thing to get excited about? I walk across our congregation and I see men and women who have discovered and are discovering that what Jesus in a life can do. We call this, and it's still, don't move it, Hunter, authentic Christian, top right up there. It said, the term Christian has become a generic term in America. person who is a Christ follower calling another person a Christian. Translated where he says almost almost you persuaded me to be a Christian. And then Peter talks about that you suffer like Christians. You see folks here's the deal. Stay with me I'm almost done. When you invite Christ into your life and he saves you and he comes into your life and he gives you a new heart, not just you walk down, and I've seen it all too often. I was one. I'm not picking on you. I was one. Walked down at the behest of a friend because he, had, he was younger than me. He had already walked down the aisle and he had said, I went last week. And so I went down and I got past the counseling and I got baptized and I was a church member and I was lost as Cooter Brown.
sense of joy, a sense of expectancy. He walks with you and he talks with you. All of a sudden, the word of God speaks to you. You can't get enough. And then, as you grow, begin, people begin to see Jesus in you. And as they do, you earn the name Christian. Oh, Brother Jerry, I don't think we had to work for our salvation. Just because you've been saved don't mean you're acting like Jesus. Just because you're saved means you're a follower of Christ. And then one day, you can develop into a disciple. I ask you this. I told the first hour, 40 years ago, the common question was this. If you were put on trial for your faith, if you were put on trial for your faith, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Most of us have a friend of some kind, distant or close, who is a Marine. It don't matter if they've been retired for 40 years. Once a Marine, always a Marine. They wear that title with honor. Honor and their camaraderie, well, all that plays into it, but let me just tell you why. It's because they had to work to earn that designation. It was not an easy thing. Many washed out. See, the truth is, you may not like this, but being a, I didn't say be saved, I said, but be a Christian. For people see him and you as almost the exactly same way. Jesus saves us. It's kind of like somebody saying to you, you know, you act just like your daddy and your mama. And sometimes you think it's a compliment and sometimes you think something else. Nobody could tell you that you act like Jesus and it would be something else. A Christian, an authentic Christian, a Christian that's seen. Would your life, would your love, would your actions, your talk, would it earn you this title of being a little Christ because you acted so much like Jesus? It would for the authentic Christian. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Thank you for your love. Thank you that you give us what we need to be an authentic Christian. Lord, speak to our hearts right now in the quietness of this moment. In the quietness of this moment, speak to us. Has God spoken to you today? Is he speaking to you right now? you continue to pray, would you stand to your feet? Everybody stand. Would you continue to pray?
If you don't think you need the prayer, would you pray for the person standing next to you? But I'm guessing that most of us need to make sure that we're authentic in our salvation, that we walk with Christ. Not that we have some kind of cultural version of Christianity that will cause us on that day to miss the mark. The altar's open. I'm here. We're just going to let the music play quietly a second. Nobody but you and the Lord talking. If he speaks to you, you can work your way to whatever aisle is close to you. People will let you out. I'll be glad to pray with you, or you can come and pray. Is there any? Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Help us, help us, Lord, to make use of our time with you. Help us to live our lives in a way that is pleasing to you. Make it into heaven and found abundant life on this earth, Jesus, and eternal life in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Just remain standing a second. I'll step back up so you guys on the back can see me. Just a couple of announcements. I'm pointing you towards September. First of all, come on, guys. You can come on up. Is that, first of all, I'm pointing you toward September the 26th. for Lauren this morning and we're good to go looking forward to a great time on, at 5 o'clock and then for anybody who's interested New Hope we're going to meet at 6 that night after the upper room uh, some other things are going on uh, your team your Associate pastor search team. A lot of good things are going on with that right now. All right, guys. By the way, if you didn't know this, and I can say this because they're going to smile because they know I'm too old, is that these guys did the fifth quarter for the county on a Friday night, and I heard nothing but good for them. Congratulations. Why don't you tell them thank you for what they do and, and congratulate them? <laughs> what are we singing? My Jesus. All right, sing with them. He makes a way where there ain't no way. He rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sin in the he can save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my God bless.
bless you guys. Have a good day.